guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Merchant's Cove by Final Frontier Games. It plays 1-5 to five players, about 60-90 to 90 minutes to play, and it's for ages 14 and up. And in the game Merchant's Cove, you're going to be playing a sort of mini-game slash Euro. Each character or player is going to gather a character, and that character is going to have a specific board and a certain way to play. And you'll be utilizing time, or actions that relate to time, on your board when it's your turn. And the board itself, the main game, it has a rondelle system in which you're going to be moving across the board. The player who's the farthest back on the rondelle and the highest up in turn order will go first, and it'll continue like that, up until the point where you hit a market phase, where hopefully, after constructing enough stuff on your board, with the time that you utilized, you'll be able to sell to certain ships with certain passengers on them when they reach port. And those passengers are going to have certain colors, and based on those colors is going to have certain items that they're going to want. You'll get bonus points for having multiples of the same color. You'll also be able to hire workers that will assist you and your factory setting. Will you play as somebody like the Alchemist, or maybe the Chronomancer, or perhaps the Blacksmith, or Innkeeper, and many more with the tons of expansions in the game, as you attempt to gather as many points, or gold, as possible by the end of the third round. The player who has the most gold, meaning they sold the most stuff to the most people, in at the end of the game is the winner of Merchant's Cove. Let's go take a look down below. I'll show you how the main game board functions, how a couple of the characters are played in order to relate to the time on the game, and then of course my review for the game. So here we have Merchant's Cove currently set up for two players. And note that this is just the main board of the game, and in a separate segment I'm going to show you one or two characters to uh, let you fully understand how the Rondell board works. But we'll first start by showing you the setup and components of the game for the main board. You're going to have your customers, and you're going to have two of them in each of the boats to start the game off with. There's going to be three boats on each side, and I've used these other little ships here to represent buoys to indicate where these ships are going to go when they get filled as the game progresses, and these guys go across these spaces here. You'll add more characters, or more merchants, uh, to the bag here, uh, from the bag into one of these ships, and when the ships get filled, they'll be placed in one of these ports here. There are three ports, and each of the ports are going to have goods on them. The large, the small, and then of course over here is kind of like the marauders area, where you're going to have to spend corruption, or gain corruption in order to sell, but you can sell either or uh, at this dock. Uh, this area over here is where you can buy additional shopkeepers. Every player is going to get a shop, and the shop is going to give you four different actions. And as you pick these guys up for the indicated cost, which is time, you'll be able to place them down into one of the four areas on your board, which you'll hopefully be able to activate at some point on your turn. And the more of these guys that you have, the more spaces you can activate. So if you activated this board right now with one character on it, you could use this ability. If you had two characters here and here, you can activate both of these guys when utilizing the activate ability. Also, additionally, at the end of the game, you'll get some type of bonus or negative effect by taking the character at the top left of the corner of the card and then when you gather the character instantly you will gain the item of the stated uh, benefit or you'll gain something like uh, reduced corruption. This one here says you'll get a large green item so you'll take your large green item and you'll put it onto one of your stands just like that. Um, and these are the different options here for when you're picking up the guys. And there's the cost down below associated with it, whether it be two time and a corruption, or a time and a corruption, or just two time. Here's the deck that you'll refill. These guys are typically going to move off of the board uh, this way. And as you gather a new one, they'll slide down, and you'll just associate a new one from the top of the deck on the very far hand, left hand side. This area is the corruption cards. Whenever you have to draw a corruption card, you'll take it from the top, add it to your pool, and it will denote how much corruption at the end of the game you're going to have. You're going to get negative points based on the amount of guys in this area and the amount of circular skulls you have on your corruption cards and the top left hand side of your character cards at the end of the game. So if I have this card here and this character, that would be two. Two times three is negative six. I'd get negative six points. You're also going to start off with one character in each of these colors here. These are like the guild halls and the specific represented colors of the guild hall. Yellow, blue, green, and red. Start with one, but you'll be placing more of them down. Basically, the ships that go to port here, the ones that get filled fully, are going to go here. And any ships that are left over, the characters that don't make it, are going to go and be placed in the spaces here in the hall, which will give you bonus points for certain characters throughout the game. A maximum of, I guess, three and three on each side can be placed. So if two of these guys went here, and two of these guys went here, and there's three dudes in each of these areas here, they would go over here. This is the Rondell system. It's pretty simple how it works. There's actions on your turn that you'll be spending. Each action is going to cost you one or two hours. When you spend an hour, you'll simply move yourself up one on the space. If you have to go two, you'll move yourself two up on the space. 
whoever is the topmost position, the farthest to the left, is going to be the person who goes first. So in this instance, it's orange. In this instance, it's blue. In this instance, it is blue as well. Back to orange. When you move over a space with a character, like this one here, you'll take one of these little dudes from the bag and you'll place it in one of the ships here that has not been filled. And then if the ship is filled, you'll place it in the port. If you make it to this space first, so you're going to go along this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 12, but if one of these little knights is here, you're actually going to move yourself up one. When you do that, you won't be able to place one of these dudes from the bag, and you will take a corruption. It means you went too far ahead too fast. Sometimes it's worth doing, sometimes it's not. Eventually, when all the boats get filled and placed at the port here, after players are taking enough actions, what's going to happen is boats are filled. Okay, let's move this little in-shot piece, one from the uh, closest player that most recently filled the boats, and then once players get two or over that space, you'll trigger the shot phase, and the shot phase is pretty simple. The boats that are filled are going to be here, they're going to unload onto the docks here, and then you're going to be able to sell to them based on the colors that are associated there. So for instance, let's just say that these guys were here at the time and I had this stuff to sell. I can only sell large items to this here. So I could choose to sell one large item um, that is yellow. That's the only one I have. Um, well, I have yellow, blue, and green, but I do not have a yellow, blue, and green meeple here, which means that I can spend a corruption to turn this guy into any color and thusly allow me to sell these for the printed value. And if I wanted to, I could spend the corruption. I could then gain the points here, which would be eight, eight, and six. And I would put 24 points down or 22 points down on this scoring tracker, which goes along the board here. Every time you go across the board, you gain one of these gems here indicating 100 points. Over here, this one is the small items. So uh, there's a yellow and a blue here. I could sell my small yellow item to this guy here for four points. If there were two yellow here, I would sell this one small item for eight points. More guys, more value. And these guys would also be included in that as well. And finally over here, I could sell to this area any of the, any of the items I want, but I'll have to take a corruption for one, each time that I want to do so. And that is going to cost me, which is, you know, well, maybe may worth it, maybe not, because you get negative points into the game for all the dudes here based on your corruption. This space here represents how these guys work, and these guys work in different ways based on what you choose here, but for the most part it's just going to state that they're going to be giving you corruption um, based on each dude and they're going to be wilds. But that might be different depending on how you play the game. And that's pretty much it. You're going to be basically filling this board up um, uh, to start the game off with. Basically all the ships are going to have their two guys. Then you're going to go into the action phase where players are going to go around the rondelle up until the point where the ships make it to the ports here. Then you're going to start the shop phase where you're going to be having these guys and you're going to sell these items to them, moving your points around the board. And then you're going to clean up. You're going to rinse and repeat, and you'll do this three times. And after the third round of the game, you'll trigger the ending, scoring bonus points for your shopkeepers, uh, for any of these things that you might have, etc., etc. It really just depends on the character that you are playing. But that's pretty much how the game works. Let's go into detail on a couple of the characters, and I'll explain how they work in terms of how you can spend actions. So here we have the blacksmith, one of the many characters in the game, but I'm going to explain and illustrate how they all function to some extent. They're all very different, but they all function in the same way as far as actions go. When it's your turn, so I'm the orange player, and I am the furthest back, highest up, I get to go ahead and take my action. You're always going to start your character on this little action space here, which indicates the fact that you can activate this board. The reason why you do that is because you can't currently activate it because there's no characters in the slots associated. So placing it there just makes the most sense. Uh, this board here specifically says I place the color die in these specific four slots. I take the other four die and I roll them and then I'm going to have these pips uh, and then I can go ahead and take my action. Uh, I can choose any of the action slots that are circles on the board and that's how all the characters function and I'll have to spend the cost and the cost is either going to be corruption or time or both. One time in any of these spots will let me craft. I can craft either two large items here or two small items here. Here is the large forge, which will allow me to gather more dye, which will let me craft more of the same type of colored items. Over here is going to let me purchase the merchant guys uh, based on their cost associated here. And then this will let me forge. So after placing dye in these spaces here and placing my character here, I can then take all of these items, uh, all these dye and these pips basically off and of course off of here and allow me to get the extra dye and of course the items which are all over here. So how it works is if I move this character from here to here, is it says, okay, I need a large item. Um, and based on the requirements here, I'm going to be placing dice. So let's say that I want a large yellow. Well, I've got a six here and I've got a four here. That's six, 10, 11. 
um, which is not 12 plus. You'll check here. I want a yellow, and this is the yellow side. Uh, 12 plus means I get it for free. 11 and 10 mean I get it, but it's going to cost me a corruption when I choose to forge. This action here is one hour, meaning I'll take my token here and move it up on the clock track, thusly ending my action. And because I'm not the furthest back, highest up, my turn is over and now it's Blue's turn. And so Blue will take their action. And let's just go ahead and say that Blue chose an action that costs two hours. Back to my turn, because now I'm the farthest back, highest up. I can go over here, and then I can go ahead and select maybe two unit dice. If I did that, I was trying to go for a large green. However, a large green, uh, three, six, seven, eight, will work. It's eight or nine, but it's gonna cost me a corruption. And, you know, I'm not uh, too corruption here. Maybe I don't wanna do that. So what I could do instead is I could go over to this side over here for one action. I could take this, place it here. This is three and three, which is six, which is less than eight. Thusly will give me a small item when I forge. I'll move myself up one on the track. I'm still the farthest up, far, farthest back. So I can then go over here and I can place this die over here. When I do that, it will basically allow me to open up one of these die when I choose to forge over here. Moving myself up one, I cross this path here. I take one of these guys out and place it on one of the boats. And then it's the next player's turn. They do their thing. They also will take one of their guys, place it on the boat. And then it's my turn. I can go over here and forge. For two actions, one and two, I can forge. Forging will allow me to get a large yellow, a small green, large yellow, small green. And I can place it on my little platform here to represent that I own these guys currently. And I can also take this blue off and any of these four die that I want, thusly opening up my guild hall faction space and additional die so that when I place them up here, I can get those items that I need. And then I will check. I'm on this mouse here, which means I do not cross the area here, which will allow me to gather a die. Instead, this is going to go off of the board and I'm going to take a corruption card, uh, which is, is, is no good. I don't want that, but I'm going to have to have that up until the point where I can hopefully, hopefully sell it. We'll see. Um, anyway, uh, moving on, <laughs> uh, this is going to continue obviously to all the boats are filled, in which case you're going to trigger the phase in which you can sell. And these items that are here are what you can sell uh, based on their color and the colored meeples in each of the spots. Big for big areas, small for small, and then of course the wild, but then that's me corruption. And that's how this character works. Pretty simple. The last little thing is, like I said, if you go over here, any characters that you have had placed under here, you would gather the items whenever you gather the characters. And then if you so choose, you can go ahead and move to this space for two actions. And uh, they all function differently for each of the characters. But this one here will let me increase or decrease pips of die that are on the board. So for instance, if I had something like this here, I could increase this by two and this by one, totaling a total of three for this action. And this one over here will let me forge twice. So if I happen to have this here and this here, I could forge a big green and a small green item, uh, which would be working for me based on the characters I have here. So the more characters down here, the better. All right, next character. So now let's take a look at the Alchemist, which is very similar to the Blacksmith as far as spaces go. You're gonna place this here, which activates over here. This will let you gather merchants. Uh, these are the unique areas now. This one here will allow you to gather balls from the specific row that you place your character in. So down here will let you gather balls from down here, 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 and of course up here will be these spaces here. When you go over here, this is just like forging. Uh, basically, you're going to be able to craft certain potions uh, based on the requirements down below. And over here, we'll let you get rid of nasty ichor, which are these black wild balls from this area here. Now, before they, of course, hit up to the top row here, for each one that hits the top row, you'll draw corruption. So it's very important to empty up your nastiness before continuing to brew more potions. So let's talk about how this character works. Basically, you can place your character here. You choose a color, so I could choose red, and then you'll take all black and red balls that fall down below into this row here. So I would take this one here because it counts as a red. I would take this one as well, it counts as a red. I can place them in any of these spaces here. There are 12 spaces that are available. I can place them down there. Based on these requirements, I either need two of the same in order to craft a small item of that color. I need two of the same in any other one to craft a large item of that color. And then three of any color will let me move these guys down into one of the pots here. So for instance, this one will go here. It'll open up that guild space, just like how the blacksmith allows you to gather more dice. This one is going to give you a wild space in this cauldron and give you additional guys as you, um, or ad additional points as you the rounds end. You'll be scoring points based on the characters that are represented in these spaces here. For instance, right now, one point for blue at the end of every shopping phase. Really, really nice. Um, and that's pretty much how it works. And you'll be able to keep going. So red and then another red. 
And after you've done that, you will take this and you will refill your little cauldron area here and, or your, I don't know what it's called, this little flasky area back to six. And this is gonna cost me two actions, so it would just simply move just like this. So if I was playing as the blue character, this guy would move over here. And then this, of course, red would get to go one, two, and up to three, place into the bag, or draw it in the bag and place onto one of the ships. And this player can go again. And he can select any of these spaces here, or he can attempt to brew. And we'll go ahead and go one more time. We'll pick this space here for another two actions. Boop, boop, I put a guy in, and I gather blue. So blue, and blue, and blue, and then I will place them into their spots. So maybe something like that. Um, and then of course after that this guy will get a chance to go He'll get his corruption card and then I can move my character over here That's one and I can go ahead and start brewing So firstly I have two blues because this this is wild and as long as you have one other color it will count This will go back into the bag giving me a small blue item and I'll actually put it on my little my little stand over here uh, This one will give me a small red item and this one over here, uh, I can do many things. I can first of all drop this thing down into the cauldron by getting rid of three of each different color. I could make a two blue and one red, or two red and one blue, um, and net myself a large of one of those colors, which I think I'll do. Or I could simply make one small. I could go ahead and take two red and just take a small red. Uh, but I'll go ahead and get rid of all three of these and I'll just go ahead and gather a large oh, blue one, I suppose. Uh, basically, the ones that go in the bag are not the black ones. The black ones will end up going over here, basically filling up this nasty cauldron. And then all the ones that are uh, colored are going to go back into the bag. And like I said, the other space you can go to is moving over here to empty all this and put them back into the bag, thusly not drawing corruption cards. And that's basically how this character works. Very similar, but also very different in style because some of these actions will allow you to take certain uh, balls from this area here and put them back into the uh, back into one of these cauldrons here. Other, this one here will let you brew two as opposed to all four when placing on the space here. Uh, this lets you get rid of a corruption, and then another one does something else. But you get the idea of how this works. So that's how all the characters kind of function. They're all very different and unique, and some of them are more, more puzzly than others. Uh, but you'll have an opportunity to take a look at all the characters when you look at the Kickstarter campaign link down below in the description. Okay, let's go into my review. I know this is a long one, but I figured you should at least see a couple of the characters and how they function and how the base game is, is played. Okay, so let's go ahead and review the game. And the first thing I would say about this game is it is beautiful. The artwork is spectacular and done very well. It's very vivid, very cartoony, and very fun. When setting up this game, one of my streamer commenters stated that it kind of looks like a pinball machine, and they're not wrong, because actually quite a few of the characters utilize certain things that a pinball machine might use, like little orbs or balls that move around the board. It has kind of a potion explosion feel on one end, and a tight euro on another end, or maybe a roll and write on another end and so you're going to have a bunch a multitude of different types of mechanics for each of the characters that you play and each character plays very differently but functions on the main game board the main game board is always the same thing it's going to be characters on the ships more characters go onto the ships as players spend time ships hit the port when all the ships hit the port you sell after you sell you'll score points check to see your guild hall if you make any points from that you'll reset up and you'll rinse and repeat three times very very straightforward the game's actually really simple to play there's just a ton of stuff in the game, and because of that, it makes it a little more complex in understanding each of the different characters. So if you get really good with one character, it'll be easy to once again go into it, the game and play that character, but if you want to try something else, it might be a little bit more challenging. Some characters are definitely more challenging than others, and play differently, and I mean quite differently. One character is literally using a dry erase board to mark dirt certain things based on the runes that they roll. Another one might be dropping down marbles or ickers into a type of like alchemy type of flask, and you'll be trying to gather the certain colors and utilize those to make potions. The blacksmith is all about rolling and re-rolling die, utilizing the pips on those die to gather certain armaments, and then the innkeeper is all about making beds for the people who are coming to port, as well as of course feeding them alcohol, which will give them points as well and there's a ton of other ones like the dragon tamer where you're going to be literally making dragons to sell to the players as or the characters as they come to port don't forget of course that there are rogues that you can utilize for bonus points but could cost you in the game as well as merchants or shop shopkeep helpers i should say that will additionally help you when you're utilizing your character board there's a bunch of these boards in the game that you'll utilize which is also super cool because they all function differently but also kind of the same in one way where if you play one you'll understand how the rest of the boards work for the rest of the characters so complexity in the different varieties of characters that you're playing but simplicity in how the game works the three rounds very very simple which i really like high quality high 
beautiful artwork quality. The way and stylization of the game is excellent. The complexity is lower, uh, and of course it scales based on the characters that you play. Uh, some characters are definitely more challenging than others, and so based on what characters you like, you're probably going to want to select certain characters to play as opposed to others. Uh, if you play this game the first, and even the second time with different characters, and you don't like those characters, that doesn't mean necessarily that you won't like the game. I would always suggest playing another character, unless you specifically don't like a type of Euro slash Rondell style game, you're going to find a character that fits you because there's a ton of different stylizations and mechanisms that you can utilize for the specific player board and character that you are using. They function differently, which makes the game so unique. I've never played a game where you have different mini games associated to each character other than maybe like Space Cadets, but even so, that's a very different style game, which uses more dexterity. This one does not. This is basically more like puzzly or more like Euro or some type of um, mechanic that allows you to kind of like engine build. And because of that, this has a unique stylization that is so cool for the type of game that this is. This is a game that's staying in my collection for a long time. I'm keeping everything for this because I know if I can't figure out what people like, and I know they kind of like, like, like Euro, some people are like heavier gamers and lighter gamers, this thing kind of fits the mold for both of those things and allows players who want more complexity to play the complex characters and people who are just learning about these type of games to play one of the more easy characters like the Blacksmith. Um, and th that's kind of the mesh of the different components and quality that this game has to offer. Of course, it does take up a lot of table space, so be prepared, especially if you're playing with five players to have a ton of additional space required for the game. If you don't have the space for the game, it's going to be very challenging to play. Now also understanding all the different rules and complexities for each character. If you get it wrong, your character might seem a little bit more complex or dangerous or difficult to play than another character. Like for instance, uh, the alchemist has a specific ichor that drops down into their well. If you don't realize that that ichor is also wild, it makes the game easier for you for each of the brewing potions. It might be more challenging because you think you've lost a space when in fact you've gained a wild. And so you have to maintain that constant checking of the different rule books and each character has their own a unique type, type of rule book that you'll be looking at when you're playing the game so there's the main base game rule book which explains the base complexities of the main board and then you have your own rules for each player which is also nice so the players can look at their specific booklet to see how to take turns and how to use their hours and then one player can just explain the base game if they've already played so even if you haven't played all the main characters you can kind of give an idea of how that works regardless though this game is excellent this game is receiving my seal of approval. It's also designed by Johnny Pat Canton. He always makes really cool games with a ton of different mini games, additional expansion content, etc, etc. It was also um, the Drawn to Adventure game that was attached to this campaign, which I really, really enjoyed as well if you want a solid roll and write. But this one here is definitely even better than that one. Like, I I cannot recommend this game more for those of you who enjoy Euros with Rondell and minigame style characters that you can choose and mix and match because every game is only different on the main board, but the characters that you choose to play are different as well. Overall, Merchant Co. Solid seal of approval. Pick this game up now. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Merchant's Cove. If you're interested, there's a link down below in the description. You can also go ahead and subscribe to this channel. Hit the subscribe button and the bell notification button to see more of our videos every day. It does greatly help us out here. New live streams every Sunday, 6.30 p.m. PST, CS Play Games, just like this one. In fact, we played this one yesterday, so if you didn't catch the live stream, you can actually watch it on YouTube, Twitch, or on Facebook to see how the game is played in total. And it was a two-player game that we played, which was a lot of fun. Um, um, and there's so many things I didn't even mention about this game that there's that you can go into, like the fact that the rogues are different and every time you utilize them in the game, you've got a ton of the different types of corruption cards that you'll place. And there's a bunch of different uh, workers that you can choose to utilize and add and expansion content, uh, etc, etc. So do at least take a look at the game and then if you don't think a shiny game like this is for you, I, I'd be shocked because I really think this one is a solid game that's going to stay in my collection for a long time. All right, guys, Patreon members, thank you so much. Moonshell's still coming along. No new updates, finishing the last little bits and pieces. Thank you so much. And as always, I look forward to traveling to Merchant's Cove with you next time.